Hello everyone, this is Dark Journalist. Today I have a special double feature episode for you, featuring Dr. Joseph Farrell. First, we'll follow up on the continuity of government COG and UFO file threat narrative, and then we'll look at his new book, Giza Death Star Revisited. Of course, Dr. Farrell's book series posits the Great Pyramid being used in ancient times as a weapon, with many implications for the planet and space. Are we ready to rewrite history? Please join us now. Now, what does Putin think when he's looking at these shoot downs of unidentified flying objects over our airspace? My my guess is that there the Russians are going through a very similar process of analysis as we are, mm -hmm. which is enhanced, of course, by their ability to gather information that you and I are not privy to. Mm -hmm. So I would guess that they're going through a very similar process of analysis. Um, their their chief concern right now, particularly with this Ukraine war going on, would be all right if 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 the United States is shooting these things down, then what's the logistical infrastructure of support behind these things? How extensive is it? Mm -hmm. The only reason that Russia went into the Ukraine, as far as I'm concerned, from a military point of view, just ruling everything else out, and just from a cold, calculating military point of view, is logistics. Right. The Russians know that there is virtually no manufacturing or industrial base for heavy munitions left in the West anymore. Yeah, we can make tanks. But we can't mass produce the projectiles that the guns and the tanks and the artillery uses. The Russians can. Hmm. The Russians can. You know, the the Russians are fighting this war on on an artillery just expenditure of projectiles scale like World War One. Wow. Incredible. Not, our ammunition stocks are you know a few days. And the Russians are expending, you know, 60,000 rounds of artillery per day since this began. Now, I, I don't care, you know, you know me, I st I'm an artillery guy and I, st I study the world wars. Mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with, with German levels of massed artillery here. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, there's, there's no other way of putting it. Wow. And you cannot tell me that the Ukraine is going to win this or that the mm -hmm. West is. The logistical infrastructure is not there. So if Putin's watching this, this balloon farce going on and we're shooting it down, the first question he's going to be thinking and the Russian analysts are going to be thinking, what's the infrastructure of support behind whoever's sending these objects? What's, mm -hmm. what's the logistical support? And then the second thing he's probably thinking is, have the Americans completely lost their marbles? Oh, yeah. Yes. We're shooting them down with aircraft that don't work according to the specifications that we're paying the billion dollars for them for, and we're using 1952 uh, air-to-air missiles, Sidewinder missiles, to shoot them down. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> But when, if they look over here and they see the COG commander mm -hmm. giving all the press conferences and even mm -hmm. raising, oh, I'm not going to rule aliens out, what do they think of that? What's going the, on in there? The first, I, I guarantee you the first thing that, that the Russian intelligence services are going to be saying, Biden's not in control. Yeah. Where is he? Yeah. This is all theater. These are the people in the control. Yeah. You want to know where nuclear football is, comrade president, is, is there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, this is kind of amazing, too, because one of the weird dances that took place at the end of the Trump administration was the switch out of the defense secretary. They got rid of him. Yeah. And that's a weird thing to do, uh, Esper. And Trump yep. fires him. And uh, you raised the possibility at the time, and I think it was very prescient, that... When Trump got COVID, 
that in fact they were going to call continuity of government because they didn't want to go through the trouble of all the hijinks around the election. Right. And a lot of things, they started talking very loosely about COG. Yep. And just previous to this, Esper had replaced a very young Terence O'Shaughnessy yeah. uh, as the COG commander and put in 509th Roswell Van Herc. Yeah. And let's and, also not forget something else. Yes. That Trump replaced the Secretary of Defense literally with an acting Secretary of Defense that would have had a term of office about 60 days, right at the end of his administration. Right. Now, what's this about? Yeah. Um, I strongly suspect, and I, folks, please don't send me a bunch of QAnon stuff in response to this. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm You're just, no Q fan. I, 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 I'm, not <laughs> part of, I'm not part of the cult. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But I strongly suspect that if you look carefully at what's going on, beginning with, with the COVID plan scandemic and all the way up to the so-called, you know, insurrection. Yeah. Um, and if you look at Trump's, actions, particularly with respect to personnel and executive orders. Right. What Trump has done, in my opinion, and you're even seeing signs of it now within in within the Republic Thug Party, if you are watching it, which I try not to do because it's disgusting and demoralizing. You mean you don't want Nikki Haley as president? Oh please. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. They shot the balloon down over South Carolina. And I know. Like, <laughs> I mean, f- will you guys please get a new playbook? That's a <laughs> little less obvious. You know, it's just uh, Dubio Rubio's out there. He's I know. I, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, I interrupted you. No, I, I, I just every time I think of that guy, I just think of bubble baths. <laughs> <laughs> Could, could we possibly have a more incompetent group of people running this country? <laughs> he loves to give like weekly interviews to TMZ. Uh, I, I oh. <laughs> <laughs> have a little dignity, please. Yeah, I know. It's just, oh, please. <laughs> just shut up. <laughs> If you look at what Trump was doing, and it looks to me like he's still actively involved in doing this, although not nearly to the extent that he was in the final days of his administration, it looks to me like he's setting up or was setting up a shadow cabinet. Hmm. Now, I'm familiar with that term because, you know, I lived in Great Britain, uh, for several years, and and this is what the parties out of power do, is they literally set up a government Mm -hmm. as they're out of power. And the lead, you know, at the time, the leader of the opposition party was Neil Kinnock, the head of the Labour Party. And Mr. Kinnock had his shadow cabinet. They were all the people that you saw in the front benches with sitting beside Mr. Kinnock. Well, those are the people that were going to take over certain positions within the government, certain bureaucracies, you know, Secretary of Defense and so on and so forth, or Minister of Defense, had he ever become Prime Minister. So in other words, a shadow cabinet is quite literally a government that's in in waiting, waiting to take over. It's it's there's no transition period where the president's in the White House picking names. No, the names are already there and ready to go. The cabinet is already in place. This was something new in in American politics in the degree that Trump appeared to me to be doing. Mm -hmm. There were always, you know, go back to the election of John Kennedy. There was a list of, you know, a short list of people that was on his list of people. But what Trump was doing, I think, was actually selecting you know, making the selection, no short list. This is his group of people that he's going to go with. And um, it looked to me like this was what was going on. And quite frankly, it looks to me to a certain extent like this is what's going on now. 
in the Republican Party. I don't believe for a moment all all the theater that we're seeing out of the Republicans. I, I don't believe it for a moment. Wow. It's Trump reassembling and preparing to take the reins again. <coughs> it looks that way to me. Um, I yeah. could be wrong. Um, you know, he does not have my support because of his flop on, on, on the quack scene and the plan scam. Day. No, I understand that. Yeah. But um, it looks to me that way. Um, what it also means to, to me is that any support that he may have from some of these <laughs> rhino people is squishy at best. He's mm. trying he's trying to weed those people out of the Republican Party. Yeah. And and to a certain extent he's been successful in other in other cases he has not. Um but I think I think it's going to be a very, very interesting election year. Uh no one is adequately addressing how rampant the election fraud is. You know, we can have all the elections in the world, and if that problem isn't fixed, it's not going to be fixed. Exactly. Look at the situation in Arizona. Ab- absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, although I do think that it is more in the public consciousness now. Yeah. And so it's a little harder to pull off on the scale that they pulled it off previously. Well, speaking of Arizona and UFOs, let me just say two things. Yeah. Stu Symington. Oh, yeah. Member Governor Symington? Yes. <laughs> and his and his ET press conference. All right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I, I'm not inclined to trust anything coming out of Arizona as all of this other stuff. <laughs> the Phoenix Lights Governor, my God. Yeah, the Phoenix Lights Governor. So, you know, Amazing. All, all we need now is for another Chinese balloon to go floating across Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, I my uh, kind of take on some of the stuff that's happening with this is that, you know, I think of that clock that they do for the doomsday clock. Yeah. And they yeah. say, hey, it's one, one hand closer to midnight or whatever. It seems to me, and I wanted to ask you this, mm-hmm. is the COG continuity of government clock now one second closer to midnight? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I, I really do. You can't, Daniel, you cannot look at this country and tell me that it is being run well. Right. And you cannot look at it and tell with any objectivity and tell me that it is maintaining its power and status in the world. Right. We are we are hemorrhaging allies. We've, yes. You know, we've now got we've got most thinking Germans against us and uh if you've been watching their reaction to this piece by Seymour Hirsch about the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. Yeah. Well that's a, that's an act of war. Yeah, of a huge now, measure. Of a huge, you know, Germany, fortunately for us, Germany right now is not the military power that it was even under Angela Merkel. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, they've allowed their military to go to pot. But she inherited a fairly good military. But it's an act of war. You know, and if there's one country in the world I don't want to have hostile to us, in addition to Russia, it's Germany. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh my God! It's not a good idea here, folks. You know, wow. we tried we tried that one after World War One, right? Know, it's, it's like the old Tom <laughs> Lehrer. It's like the old Tom Lehrer song. We taught them a lesson in 1918, and they've hardly bothered us since then. You know, <laughs> it's just nuts, and it's an act of war against Russia. So you can't, you cannot look and tell me that the the deep state people have run this country well and they there has to be in my opinion a certain segment within the american deep state that recognizes that we've we've got to do something to to stop this hemorrhage 
So, yeah, for all of these reasons, I think that that hand on the doomsday clock, at least as far as the COG people are concerned, is, yeah, it's it's a lot closer to midnight than it's ever been before. It moved. It moved. Yeah, it moved. In, in the last few months, it has moved significantly. Um, yeah. What that portends, you know, does it portend this country – throwing off the last vestiges of the banana republic that it is and just, you know, being ruled by a military junta, you know, mm-hmm. you know, wh- what, what is going on here? It's been a long time coming, mm-hmm. but it's, it is part of the inevitable consequences of, you know, shooting a, a, a president and then his alleged assassin in 1963. Uh, exactly. These these people have been ruling the country, and now they've got to step out more into the open. And the more they step out into the open, the more people see them for what they are. And you know, <laughs> it's it's Rome under Diocletian. It's amazing because the taking Kennedy out back in 1963 is a major COG action. Yes. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, Professor Scott points out is that that network that they used was utilized uh, in the communications, yes. emergency communications on the day of the assassination. Oh, big time. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's a trail that's dramatic and it leads right back yes. to the super secret organization, which is prepared uh, through General Van Herc now to just step into, yeah. you know, the combatant commander position and appoint a bunch of regional governors. And that's it. Yeah. Amazing. If you think about it. Um, One of the other things that comes up in relation to this, and I'm going to wind this down with this is the, when I think about emergency powers, Joseph, I go to the enabling act of 1934. And that's the, you know, that's really the prototype, the model that's being utilized here. And what happened in the Enabling Act? Well, Adolf Hitler, the Enabling Act, under the Weimar Constitution, uh, there was a provision that would allow the chancellor to rule by decree if a certain, I think it was two-thirds or three-fourths majority in in the uh, Reichstag at the time, voted that power. And this is what happened. The Reichstag was burned down, uh, the German Capitol building, uh, the suspicion has always been that the Nazis themselves set the fire mm-hmm. because they were ready to go with a new Reichstag, you know, assembly hall in the, in the Kroll opera house, just as fast as, as that, right. um, you know, that, that whole thing was converted almost overnight into the new. Wow. Yeah. Um, but, and you can you can see you can see that opera house on old newsreels of Hitler speaking in front of the Reichstag. That's that's not the Reichstag in the building. That's the Kroll Opera House. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's the Kroll Opera House. That's that's the place that they built. You know, the suspicion has always been that the Nazis themselves set that fire. Uh, not the least because the man who presided over the trial of the guy accused of setting it was Hermann Goering. You know. Oh. <laughs> What a wonderful guy to have prosecuting you. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but, that's the false flag that gives them. That's the false flag yeah. that gives the Nazis the excuse to pass the Enabling Act. And then on the day that the Enabling Act is being debated and voted, the Nazis have their strong arm thugs out on the street making sure that whoever goes in to be present for the vote is going to vote the proper way. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it, it basically, what the Enabling Act did is it it combined the office of president of the Reich, which was the fellow that could actually disband the Reichstag, and the office of chancellor, the chief executive, in into one individual. Right. That's exactly what it did. Incredible it, move. It's an incredible move, and it allowed Hitler basically to rule by decree, which, of course, he does. Mm-hmm. Um, and toward the end of the war, when Hitler signs his last will and testament, he breaks the office of chancellor and president back apart. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that has, yeah. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> that opportunity there and that Hindenburg. Oh, they're Hindenburg's dead, so you know. Hindenburg is dead. Yeah. 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 We'll just combine yeah. these offices and I'll be able to do everything, everything. as a dictator. Yeah. Um, it's got it's got a ring to it, that enabling uh -huh. act. It feels like, oh, you know, domestic terror bills, COG, COG, UFO threat, National yeah. Defense Authorization Act, the whole nine yards. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph, incredible. In the last couple minutes we have here, you're doing a new book. It's coming out. Um, it's finished, in fact. Uh, there's there's two books. Uh, one book is finished. That's the rewrite of the original Giza Death Star trilogy. Wow. Uh, Fantastic. It's called the Giza Death Star Revisited. Mm -hmm. uh, that book is about half copy and paste from the original three. So I don't want people to buy the book and say, oh, he's just repeating these other books. I am repeating the other books, but in expanded a different edition, in an expanded edition and in a different order of presentation of the material so that with obviously a lot of new material so that people can see the argument more clearly for why I think that structure was a weapon. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the book that's coming out. I think sometime this month or next month. It's already up on Adventures Excellent. Unlimited website. I'm working on another book. Adventures Unlimited website, you said. Yeah, Adventures okay. Unlimited website. And as soon as the book is actually out, I'll put it up on my website. Fantastic. But um, I'm working on another book that is related to the weapon hypothesis of the Great Pyramid. Um. I originally put an epigraph in the very first version of the Giza Death Star, which I sent off to a publisher. And the publisher rejected the book. And in the meantime, I had researched more and added more material. So I'm glad that the book was originally rejected because the one that was published had a lot more material in it. But mm -hmm. I took out from the one that was published, I put, took out an epigraph that was in the original version. And the reason I took it out was I thought, no, this is going too far. There's no way that this is able to be talked about with the degree of um, referencing and argumentation that it needs in order to be understood and accepted. So I took it out. And I put it back. I'm writing a book now where I put it back because now – the science is sort of caught up with the speculation so that I can talk about this really wild, I fully admit it's so out there, people are going to be dumbfounded when they see it because it, it's the other 50% of the weapon hypothesis. Wow. The weapon hypothesis does not stand or fall without this information, so you don't need it. But it is changed dramatically. Uh, if this new hypothesis is true, and if the new hypothesis is true, it changes a lot of other things too. And which will be immediately apparent once people read that book, but I'm not going to give the slightest bit of a clue as to what it is and why. Because had I written about it, pe people who think I'm off the rocker already for thinking it was a weapon, I would have been locked up and put in a rubber padded room. <laughs> <laughs> but but now it's okay to do because other people are talking about this. So now, you know, we're ready to go. I think it's a fascinating, of course, you know, those books uh, on the pyramid and the Giza death star are incredible and classic. And for you to go back and expand on that material is, is very exciting. Um, well, all, all of my subsequent books after that initial trilogy, you'll discover when you read the initial trilogy, as I basically laid out the subjects of all the rest of the books, and I mean all 38 of them. So they are crucial books. Um, they just, they were not written. I was new to the field at the time, so I kind of pulled my punches. I didn't, I didn't uh, present the material as clearly as I should have. And in the process, kind of confused people. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not going back on anything I've said in those three books. I, mm -hmm. But I do try and clarify uh, in the new book. Try to clarify the argument so that people can follow it better. Plus, inject the new material. It's become more clear over time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Twenty years ago, when I first 
argued the idea I, I came up with what I was calling phi crystals, for example. Crystals whose with such a strange index of refraction that they literally trap light and act as a kind of singularity. Okay. Mm. And at the time I was even debating whether to include that idea. Well, material science has advanced to the point that those types of things are not as nearly as far fetched as they were 20 years ago. So, you know, these things, you know, it's, it's one of these books that, that uh, it's either right or it's wrong. You know, there's no two ways about it, and I fully, I fully acknowledge that the that the hypothesis is really a wild and woolly hypothesis. It really is. <laughs> oh, it's incredibly. I think the whole thing's ahead of its time. Uh, you know, and those first, those three books around the Giza Death Star, that trilogy um, is something that really, you know, you've seen people talk about. Uh, the Giza pyramid as a power station. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've seen things like this and there's some unique arguments out there about it, but mm-hmm. this is really, you know, goes to a totally different level. I think this goes to a totally different level. It, it, it to my mind, it, it rationalized the creepiness mm. that I personally have always felt about the structure. Now, you know, other people don't, don't have that kind of feeling or, or, perception of the structure that i do but i've ever since i was a boy i thought there's just something really creepy about this thing (laughs) and i guarantee you folks when you read the restored epigraph and i'm quite certain many of you will recognize immediately what that epigraph is i guarantee you when you recognize and see that epigraph the creepiness will be fully rational (laughs) <laughs> it's and it's it's that epigraph that forms basically the nucleus mm. or hypothesis of this fifth book i'm working on now you know i i wanted to just throw this out there since we're talking about the pyramid as, as we're wrapping up here the um there's a series of casey readings about the pyramid yes. and how it was built in this unusual manner and they floated the stones into place <laughs> yeah all around. Oh, he may not be far off there either. <laughs> There's something really interesting about that, and I wish they had asked him more and just sat down for days and asked him questions about this. One of the weird things that he said when they asked him, are there predictions contained in the pyramid? And he said, if you know how to read them, yes, they're, they're there. And they said, well, how would you read them? He said, in the type of stone, in the curvature, and the diagrams, and all this. And then they said, how specific are those predictions? And he said, oh, they're specific enough to name the, the street names on where the individuals impacting things on a historical level will you know, be born and, th- and things of this nature. So that's how specific he was saying the well, pyramid was. There is, there, it's oh. interesting that he had that view. I didn't know that he did. But uh, last week, Walter Bosley had a panel discussion with me and a couple of his friends. And he, Walter asked me the question, could you use this weapon to cause an effect in the distant future or in the distant past? In other words, can you, can you uh, weaponize effects through time? And my answer was yes. Interesting. Once you understand what's going on with the dang thing, yeah, you can. And I know that's that's another wild and woolly time idea. impacts uh-huh. over time, time yeah. travel impact. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and of course we got into grandfather paradox, and I said this is not the kind of physics that you're dealing with. Oh, oh, you know, oh how, yeah. How does retro causation work? Hmm. I suggest to everybody that you can avoid the paradox by avoiding linear thinking. Before Abraham was, I am. Hmm. (laughs) Joseph, what does it mean if Casey's looking at it and saying it will pinpoint an individual in time and space? I think if, if, my suspicion, Daniel, is if anything, if Casey is zeroing in on the physics, then this is the way the physics is translating itself into his mind. Mm-hmm. In other words, he's not—he's—he's he's giving us an 
an analogical illustration. The illustration may not be true down to its last detail, but what he's really latching on to here is that you're dealing with a physics that can predict a, a, a set, and I'm using that word very deliberately, a set of elements that go to comprise a particular event. Mm -hmm. Okay? Once you get to that point, then, yeah, certain details will pop out, and that's what's popping out to him. Okay, so he's he, what he's really doing is he's perceiving the principle behind retro causation. Mm -hmm. That's what he's perceiving, or wow. future casting, if you will. How do we get Walter's precise question was Could this have been used to cause the Tunguska explosion in 1908? My answer was yes. Interesting, why? Because you're tuning the weapon to the target. You're not pointing and aiming it. It's not a linear weapon. You're tuning it to a specific set of things. And there's that word again. Hmm. This, is, wow. this is analogical thinking to the highest degree that you can imagine. And another way of saying analogy is what in physics? Harmonics. Oh, fascinating. Right. Right. Uh, well, that means we're going to have to pay attention to this book. <laughs> well, if nothing else, if nothing else, get the book and, and read about the final proof that Howard Weiss actually did forge all of those painted hieroglyphs. Oh, in, yeah. If nothing else, because, and I'm not the one that cracked it. I'm not going to tell you who. Okay. But there's a guy that cracked it, <laughs> and it's... It's just delicious and delightful what he did. <laughs> Don't you know it's just Khufu's tomb? Come on. Oh, please. It's just... <laughs> Do you know that there's actually, no one has ever come up with an explanation for it. There's actually a little inscription on the actual real entrance of the Great Pyramid. There's a, it's the only inscription that they think was actually genuine and there. And it's a little four, it's four little symbols. And it looks almost mathematical, except that one of the symbols is indeed the, the one of the hieroglyphs for Khufu, but the hieroglyph is turned 90 degrees from the way it's normally oh. written. But that's, that's the only one. And it occurs in the context of other other symbols that are not hieroglyphical at all. Mm -hmm. And it's a little inscription right beneath the two corbels of the main entrance of the Great Pyramid. I don't know if you've ever seen that picture. Of the, yes. Of the it's, it's about yay big. What do you think it means? It may be related to the epigraph that mm. I'm not going to tell you until you re read the new book. And I know, I know you, it's going <laughs> to, it's going to hit you right in the forehead when you read. It. <laughs> I, I, I know wow. I, particularly with the case, your, 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 uh, affection for Edward Casey and his <laughs> readings. I know this one is going to, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it may, who knows? It may be that little inscription that Casey was tuned into. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Wow. Well, you know, um, I wanted to ask you, considering the pyramid, that whole thing about the Gantabrank shafts. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think those little shafts are all about? Because they're not about air circulation no, or whatever. No, they're not. I, I think. I think genuinely that Chris Dunn has that aspect of the engineering worked out. They were somehow shafts that were used to feed a gas into the structure. Interesting. And and the the little copper poles and things that that they found in those shafts, uh, the door and so on and so forth, so on and so forth, were in my reading of things to, to create a small plasma pinch. Oh, right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Chris Dunn's the one that, that has hypothesized that, that all the indications are plus the smell 
inside the structure. He did the basic chemistry and concluded, well, they were, they were manufacturing hyd hydrogen gas inside the structure. Hmm. And the, the pyramid at the upper end of the Grand Gallery, there is evidence of an explosion that took place oh wow inside the structure in ancient times because if you go into the king's chamber you know we all see these diagrams of the king's chamber but in actual fact the king's chamber looks like there was an explosion inside of it because there's a bunch of cracks the the floor is not entirely smooth and so on and so forth um so the evidence is that there was sometime at some time in the distant past some sort of event inside the structure Interesting. So Dunn hypothesizes that, that the hydrogen was sparked and went into an explosion. Well, from that, if you read the original three pyramid books, I went on to posit that the reason that there was a spark was that they were plasma pinching. They were creating a plasma in an endothermic, that is to say a cold state, and they were pinching that plasma electrically and magnetically. In other words, that the plasma was undergoing the same kind of stress of the plasma in the sun, but it was undergoing stress electrically. Think Ronald Richter here, folks. Oh, right. Yeah, this is all related. There's a reason I put all the Nazi stuff in those pyramid books. This is all related. Mm. Um, in addition to that, there are other things about plasmas that are incredibly intriguing. So... Put it all together, yeah, you've got a weapon, and it's an extraordinarily powerful one when it was Incredible. an operate. Um, just what happened to the capstone? Like all things, it's it's missing, just like the yeah. things that whatever they were in the Grand Gallery are missing. Mm -hmm. uh, the capstone, in fact, if you read... If you read the Epic of Ninurta the way that Zechariah Sitchin reads it, okay... Mm -hmm as a text referring to the Great Pyramid. Now, Sitch is the only one doing this, to my knowledge, reading Sumerian texts that refer to ziggurats or acres or mountains, as, as they're sometimes called in, in those texts. He's the only one reading these texts in reference to the Great Pyramid. Mm. Now, he's got a very specific reason he's doing that. I hinted at it. In the original three books, I made it much more explicit in this fourth book so that people would understand this is not just Sitchin making things up again. This, mm -hmm. no, he's not doing that. If anything, he's being very meticulous with details. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the Epic of Ninurta, it is specifically stated that there is a stone that was rolled off a mountain and it comes tumbling down and it breaks into pieces and then they gather up the pieces and basically destroy it so in other words reading it the way Sitchin reads it there was a capstone they took it down as part of that inventorying process where they're taking all those stones in the grand gallery and they're taking them out they're destroying some they're carting away others for use in other applications and then there's a very small little class of these things that i talk about in the cosmic war that could not be destroyed, oh. so they're hidden. Interesting. Now, if you're if you're an interplanetary society and you're trying to hide things like that, that you don't want anybody to get their hands on, where might you hide them? Well, one place would be Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. Another place would be the moon. And another really? place would be Mars. Mm -hmm. remember I pointed out in the Giza Death Star the very first book or the Giza Death Star um, deployed mm -hmm. the profile resemblance of the face on Mars with the profile resemblance of the Babylonian god Nergal who right. by the way is the Babylonian god of Mars Oh, right. That's, yeah. not a, that's not a coincidence, in other words, is what I'm suggesting. So, you know, on and on we could go. Why is, Ky why is Cairo named for Mars? Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, why, why, do, why do the Arabs call the Sphinx Abu Hol, father of terrors? 
Right. Uh, <laughs> um, do you think then that when they were taking the capstone off the pyramid, they that was part of the weapons inventory is what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. What you see there at Giza is the shell of mm -hmm. a machine. Because by anybody who has looked at it with an engineer's eye, the structure is missing things. Mm -hmm. It's missing things inside the grand gallery that used to be there. It's missing something that was there in the king's chamber. It's missing something that was in that sarcophagus, falsely so-called, in the king's chamber. It's missing a lot of stuff huh. that made it work. So this is why I tell people, no, you can't go back in there and turn it on again and have it blow something up. It's not going to do that because it's, you know, it's like, the it's like, plugs yeah, gone. it's like, yeah, no. the spark plugs are gone. Um, right. the, the cylinders and the engine block are not there anymore. You know, <laughs> use whatever analogy you need, but there's stuff missing from it. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, the story of the Hall of Records there at the Sphinx, is there any crossover with the Hall of Records and that inventory of burying these things? Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. If you look at the Great Pyramid and look at the manifold, numerous, almost too many to be cataloged, analogical, dimensional resemblances between that structure and the dimensions of local space. Note what I just said. You are clearly de dealing with a machine that was designed to be resonant to all of those things in local space under most configurations that it might assume or have assumed. Once you understand that, then you can go on and look at the numbers in those dimensions and see how they're all harmonics of each other. Mm. So this thing is engineered to the nth degree. It is, this is why people are fascinated with it. Whoever came up with this dang thing built so much into it that that pyramid and those dimensions themselves constitute your hall of records. Oh, oh it's embedded. It's embedded yes. in the structure. Yeah. And it's necessary to the function of the structure. Mm -hmm. You can't have, you cannot have an oscillator of local space time unless it's oscillating local space time in all configurations or all possible configurations. There's your KC time element. Right. Yes. Think, think of the Great Pyramid as a big pipe organ. A pipe organ is nothing but a collection of harmonic oscillators. And think of the pyramid as nothing but a collection of, you know, lots of organ pipes, each one designed to be resonant to some specific dimension or configuration of local space time that's what it is Incredible. Un undeniably um <laughs> you know it's interesting the uh one of those questions in the casey readings about the plaza the the, the plateau uh -huh. um they said why did they select this plateau <laughs> and one of the pieces of the answer very interesting they said well you know actually they were doing archaeology uh -huh. He places it in 10,500 BC is when they uh -huh. made it. Yes, you know, he's very right. different from the 2500 BC. So he's got that whole time shift yeah. there. But then he's saying, even then, they had done archaeology to figure out where to do this, and the archaeology yes. led them there. So it was already an ancient site. Uh, in fact, that is the view that I myself presented in, mm -hmm. in the three pyramid books, particularly in uh, the third one, because there are Egyptian texts, and you'll read about these again in, in the fourth book. There are e Egyptian texts called the Edfu Temple texts that record a period of time when, when the Egyptians built from the Zeptepi the first time, built a mound, a mountain. 
And that original mound or mountain was destroyed hmm. in a big colossal war. Well, that's in the third book. Uh huh. And it's ah. also in the fourth book. And okay. then it, whoever came along and at the exact same spot rebuilt it. Incredible. So, wow. Again, All right. Yeah, again, he's, he's that's had, a crisscross there. My that's God. a crisscross. Yeah, that's a crisscross. So yeah, there was. There's always been something there at that site. Always. What is it about that site that really is interesting? Well, for one thing, it's it's in almost the exact center of the surface mass of the Earth. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 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 That's in other words, the Great Pyramid is the ancient prime meridian. If you look at most of the megalithic sites in the world, Angkor Wat, Teotihuacan. They're based on specific alignments to Giza. Wow. You know, it's yes. like that's okay. the Greenwich Meridian. Mm -hmm. That's why the Atlanteans came in there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Joseph, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's it's a creepy structure. There's <laughs> there's this <laughs> you know, I, I'm one How of these. How old is it? How old is it? In my opinion, it's the oldest structure on the surface of the planet. Amazing. Um, I have no difficulty dating it to 10,500 BC. Uh, I met Ralph Ellis one year at a conference, and after the conference, he and I were talking about uh, the pyramid, and he told me that the debris around the base of the Great Pyramid included a lot of fossils huh. that could only have been put there, in his opinion, by the flood, and that some of those fo fossils were, you know, several million years old. But, you know, you have this, you have this constant association of the Great Pyramid with the flood. Mm -hmm. um, and I finally tracked down the Persian reference uh, to the fact that when the casing stones were still on the structure, about halfway up the structure, there was a water line. Oh, you know, that's that's a big flood. <laughs> My God, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's uh, that's a little bit more than the local rain, but <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, there's a Steiner quote about the that plateau as well, uh, which goes uh, right along with that. And he said, um, you know, they were talking about the plateau and he said, well, you know, in relation to the plateau, you're going to find that beneath it uh -huh. buried under a flood originally was a temple of ISIS. Uh -huh. And the, so he, he concurs with Casey that this was a much older site. Oh yeah. Even yeah. by 10,500 BC. Oh yeah. I, th I think it is. I absolutely think it is. The site that we see there now uh, is also a layered, leveled site, but there's no doubt in my mind that's, that it's there for a reason. It's always been uh, of crucial strategic significance, and mostly for physics reasons. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard place to reproduce. So, yeah, I, I absolutely think the site is of great antiquity. Very, Probably. very old. Um, what is the Sphinx? I think the Sphinx, personally, mm -hmm. is a, a monument to whomever either built or planned that site or expropriated it. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, I don't buy that the Sphinx is an Egyptian artifact. I'm with Robert Schock. The the evidence of flooding water erosion on the main body of the Sphinx is too hard to ignore. Right. So that dates it at least to the Egyptian subpluvial period, which is approximately 8,000 BC, way mm -hmm. before dynastic Egypt is a gleam in Khufu's eye. Mm -hmm. And the other reason I think that the Sphinx is some sort of expropriated monument is the head of the Sphinx is far too small dimensionally to have been the original head of the rest of the monument. 
Uh-huh. Someone came along and recarved the head that we associate with it. Um, many people speculate that it was either, a, you know, the dog, the god Anubis, or some other thing, and that later on the Egyptians came along and carved the what to me looks like a queen's face mm-hmm. on, on the Sphinx. Um, but whatever the Sphinx was, I think it's kind of a, it's kind of like the mission patch that you see for military bases in, in the United States. It's, it's, it's got something to do with the function of the compound and it's, it's hardened military site. Um, that's what I think it is. Uh, it's, it's a monument to the, it's a monument to the gargantuan ego that would build such a monstrous thing. Mm. Um, that's the way I look at it. And, you know, I'm, I'm basing again on the fact that the Arabs in the region actually call the Sphinx, the father of terrors. Why? Right. You know, why, why is Cairo named after the planet Mars? You know, what is all of this? Mm. Why the constant association with war? Yeah. Um, it's a constant association with war because that's what it was for. <laughs> that's easy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's, that's, that's basically the, basically the case that I've tried to outline. Amazing it, that it's survived all this time. That shows that it's something. It's a hardened site. Mm. It's a hardened military site. You know, the idea that it's a weapon is not my idea. It's Zechariah Sitchin's. Oh. And, yeah, yeah it's, it's not my idea. It's his. And well, what Sitchin had those flashes of brilliance. He, well, it's more than a flash. He wrote a whole book about it, you know, right. the, war, the wars of gods and men. Yeah. And I'm thinking, my word. And no one has sat down to try and see if there's a physics that might make this possible or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that's a breathtaking hypothesis to put out there. Mm hmm. And no one had done anything with it. The closest anyone had come was Chris Dunn and, and the Giza mm-hmm. Power Bank. And, you know, you start talking weapon, and then you're running into that crowd that wants everything ancient to be jonquils and daisies. Well, I've got bad news for you folks. That ain't in the, any of the texts anywhere. <laughs> uh, and in terms of uh, our space brothers, so they seem to be a little hostile in the ancient texts. Yeah, they seem to be not just a little hostile. Uh they don't like these little monkeys down here, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and we do have evidence that, you know, there's all sorts of strange stuff on, on the planets in this system. And we've got a planet that was blown up and, you know, uh, yes. uh, that, that to me is a huge part of the story. You know, Incredible. it's not, just, it's not just star Wars. It's, it's, it's part of the celestial mechanics of where we are. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, Sitchin was a, a real innovator in a number of areas. I'll tell you what bothers me, Daniel, is that somewhere somebody either is tapping into this or mm-hmm. somebody knows a heck of a lot. Uh, because look at the exploded planet. Mm-hmm. What was the name the 19th century astronomers gave it? Krypton. Krypton. Oh, that's right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Why then do you get in American comic books a mytholo- a whole worked out mythology of an exploded planet named Krypton with a Superman mm. who comes to this planet to help everybody out? Right. You know. Let alone the you know the messianic Christ-like overtones of that. What's what's with that? Yeah, uh, there's there's too much of this stuff floating out there, I think, for this to be all entirely accidental. Uh, they understand know. it on this level. Yeah, and yeah. they feed it down into the culture. And pieces. they feed it down into the culture, or like Casey, they're tuning into it somehow. You oh, know, it's, it's part yeah. of the, you know, it's part of, it's part of some sort of uh, 
information field. Who knows? But I, you know, the longer I, I study this stuff after 38 books on it, I'm convinced that there's somebody, a group of people here on this planet that know all this stuff and have figured out how to uh, how to decode these ancient texts and they're doing so and they're kind of putting it out there as memes at select points to get people thinking about it. I mean, stop and think of Zechariah Sitchin for a moment. Mm-hmm. How strange a man he really is. And I'm not saying strange in the sense to belittle him. I'm saying yeah. strange in terms of his his published biography here's Mm -hmm. a guy who went to the london school of economics earned a i think it was a master's degree in political science and you know cultural anthropology or something i don't know Mm -hmm. but trained as an academic who then goes on to become an antiquities dealer with headquarters in rockefeller center doing doing a series of six books called the earth chronicles all based on his personal reading and acquaintance with ancient texts. And these subsequently get published. And then you have academic, an academic or two come along who are literally charged to kind of debunk the whole thing. The wow. whole, the whole story is very weird. If you ask me, you know, There's antiqu- no question. yeah. Antiquities, uh, an antique dealer, even in New York city, with headquarters in Rockefeller Center, yeah. that's kind of pricey. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, he could have found a very interesting antique somewhere. That else. too, you know. <laughs> I mean, this this is the guy that likes to spend his time in you know in the New York Public Library reading Acadian texts. So, yeah, you know. <laughs> I I love his books. Oh, I do thought, too. Yeah, I do too. But I've always been curious about the guy. Where yeah. is the where really is the financing coming from? Doesn't add up. Doesn't add up. Doesn't add up. And he's you know what he is publishing is such a breathtaking reconstruction of of stuff. <laughs> you know he may get the dates wrong and he may be completely out to lunch about planet Nibiru and every 3,600 years it comes crashing into the solar system and they're mm-hmm. using rockets to accomplish all of this, <laughs> you know? Right. There, there are God, they hammered that so hardcore Yeah. at a certain point. So yeah. it's sort of, in, in a way, it almost takes it out of context the way that they uh, popularized it because it's like, oh, you know, this guy is just about this one weird planet. No, no. The, the macro scenario that Sitchin puts forward makes no sense. And the problem is you can't be a, a man that smart and put forward a scenario that stupid. That's the uh, other thing that bothers me about it. And because when you look at the individual little details of his scenario, that's where you, that's where you find these brilliant gems mm-hmm. of, of insight. I mean, forget about rockets and space travelers and, pardon me, the planet near Biru and them wanting to mine gold. You know, all the nonsense. Mm-hmm. And just concentrate on, on the little nuggets. And the little nuggets are just astonishing. You know, like Great Pyramid being a weapon and they're fighting wars over and with the dang thing. <laughs> um, you know, what? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, it fueled your own expansive oh, yeah. idea of this whole thing. That's the incredible thing is it had this great influence on you. Oh, huge, huge. Yeah. It, it, it was a confirmation of everything that I heard my father and his engineering friend talking about, you know, when they're playing cards on Friday night. And then, you know, you go to North Dakota and off in the distance, you see that old uh, phased array radar thing. Um, it, <laughs> it, 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 wow. confirmed, yeah. it confirmed it for me. Yeah. You know, why Why have I always had this feeling that this, this thing isn't as nice and good as people are saying it is? Uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, there's, there's stuff about Sitchin that, that remain unanswered. And interestingly enough, I find it very odd that that uh, he's been dead now, you know, over a decade, and he lived yeah. a very long life. Oh yeah, he was quite well known. Uh, that no one has done a biography about this man. Right. He had he's yeah. had 
enormous influence, whether we like it or not, you know, whether we like him or not, he's mm-hmm. had an enormous influence. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Not the slightest, not the slightest mention. It's true. It's almost like they take his concepts and really hammer the Anunnaki. Yeah. You know, mining for gold and all this kind of stuff, but they leave him out now. They leave him out and they concentrate only on the, the macro scenario rather than the nuggets in, in the little parts of it. Uh, you know, he, he is as significant to alternative research as Richard Hoagland. And yet he, he has had no, uh, autobiographical scholarly, you know, attempt to dig into him. Why, mm-hmm. why did this man emerge so suddenly onto the alternative research scene? Did he get tired of you know, dealing in antiques? What made him go to the London School of Economics? Who were his professors? You know, London School of Economics? Come on. Wow. We know a lot more about von Daniken than we do this guy. Yeah, precisely. And Sitchin has been in my estimation, vastly more influential than von Däniken. Mm-hmm. Von Däniken yeah. is kind of the, the popularizer of Sitchin-esque ideas. True. Uh, True. But you, you can't sit down and read Sitchin just as bibliographies alone. <laughs> you mm. know? Yeah. Um, I remember his quote, Adam is the first test tube baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that too. So you know where where is this guy coming from? And he had to have backing. Yeah, I mean, there there's just too much about the story that don't make sense. There's there are backers here somewhere involved in this whole thing. No you know, question. No his question. his books his books his six books in the Earth Chronicles strike me as uh, Judy Wood's book. Where did the towers go? It's a briefing document or set of briefing documents. Right. That someone decided to publish. Amazing. And, uh, well, Judy brought a lot forward there in that book that was just missing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Piles of data that that were utterly overlooked in, in most presentations of it. So, yeah, there's, I, I don't know. Um, there's something about this whole thing, you know, this, this weapon hypothesis that he had that, uh, and the way he presented it in those books, you know, he devoted a whole book in that series of books to the Pyramid Wars, a whole book. Wow. So, whatever you make of the macro scenario that he comes up with and that they keep hammering, he thought enough of it to devote a whole book to it. Huh. I, you know, the one that I have here is the 12th planet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's interesting what you're saying about him and the, the background that's going on there, because obviously he had access oh, yeah. to fantastic information that just wasn't public. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such academically refined information. It's public in the sense that if you're an academic specialist, you'd know about it, mm-hmm. but otherwise, no, I mean, look at his bibliographies. Uh, if he's doing all of this research himself, uh, it's, it's astonishing. If he's using people to find these things, it's still equally astonishing because at least he knows who to use. You know, this this mm-hmm. is the old saw. You know, how do you, you how do you get around in the Bodleian Library in Oxford? Well, you just do. You just <laughs> go in and suffer the inconveniences of the damned place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to to try and find your way around. Well, right. It, it strikes me that Sitchin's in this position. So he's he's got some sort of network of people behind him mm-hmm. that has also never been probed. You, you simply can't do it. 
you can't and, do that kind of research without going to somebody who says, oh, you need to go read such and such. You'll find it in this book or that book. And here's the call number, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can't do and it. And missing um, from the scene is the internet for the most part. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Try. Yeah. Folks, your internet skills are going to serve you absolutely zero in, in the Bodleian. Trust me here. <laughs> it, it, they are going to do you absolutely no good whatsoever. Wow. <laughs> yeah. whatsoever. Uh, this is the kind of information you're dealing with with Sitchin. Um, yeah. it's, it's specialized academic information. And for him, even to have been selected as a public presenter of it, he had to master enough of it to present in the way he did, mm -hmm. you know, in his public talks and so on and so forth. Um, there's something going on here with him. And uh, I, I, to I think me it's, you're right that he is certainly one of the most influential. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, you know, certain aspects of the alternative research community he invented. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you go back and look at all six of those Earth Chronicles, not just the 12th planet, but, you know, all of them, there is not an area of alternative research having to do with any of the ancient cultures on this planet that he did not touch upon. Oh, wow. I, and I mean, not just Mesopotamia, but Mesoamerica, South America, the Vedas, Chinese, you name it. He said something about it, hmm. and he did so by reference to obscure primary texts. No two ways about it. Right. Many of which he could read. You know. Right. <laughs> um, I, you know, sorry, folks. I'm sorry, but I just don't have time to sit down and learn Akkadian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, and if I want to read stuff like that, I'll go buy a rooster and let the rooster <laughs> scratch on the ground and I'll try and read it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a project. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sometime we'll have to talk about the Rosetta Stone uh, in relation to some of this, because I think what you have to say about that is interesting. In, in that it took 20 years to decipher and that maybe it was sort of planted. I Listen, I have long had a suspicion about that whole Napoleon mm -hmm. Bonaparte takes it in his noggin. I mean, the premier military, political, geopolitical strategist of the late 17th and early 18th and 19th centuries, pardon me, 19th century, all of a sudden wants to go to Egypt wow. and drag all of France's <laughs> intellectual elite with him and half of the French fleet. <laughs> because, what on earth? That's because, incredible. Because yeah. Maurice de Talleyrand... <laughs> Right. Puts it in his head. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is another narrative that's never made a lot of sense. To yes, me. I know. What is he doing there? Who knows? Mm. But um, apparently, one of the things he's doing there is spending the night in the king's chamber. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's among some kind other of things. <laughs> and you know, this business of of. The French Lieutenant Oatpool, by the way, tripping over the Rosetta Stone and finding the Rosetta Oatpool, folks. Oatpool, the family name associated with Baron Garçonnier of Rennes le Chateau and that strange little church that he built at, at the end of the 19th century. Oh. It's the same family, guys. Wow. Wow. What's up with that? And how do oh. we have, yeah. You know, this is a little too convenient. He's like, look, here's the Rosetta Stone. Oh, here. Oh, by the way, <laughs> looky here, Monsieur Colonel. Uh, <laughs> and Champollion takes his time with it. And Champollion off and running, and voila. <laughs> no, look, I, this is another narrative. I'm sorry. I'm just not by it. Yeah, I mean it's 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 almost as cornball as Colonel Vice 
supposedly finding those painted hieroglyphics in the relieving chambers above the king. I mean, it has that that convenient yeah. cornball. No. <laughs> Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, come on. Wow. People. Yeah. <laughs> no. What and, is going know, on there? Well, Napoleon's not a stupid guy. Right. You know, he's not doing this for kicks and giggles, <laughs> you know, <laughs> any more than Herman Goering is sponsoring a science fair project in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not buying that one either. <laughs> Joseph, just amazing details on all of this. We all look forward to Giza Death Star Revisited, the new book that's coming out. And we'll have you back on shortly to announce another uh, very interesting investigation, something we'll look at together. Of course, all of your work is available at GizaDeathStar.com. Please join us on Friday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern for the Dark Journalist X series. See you soon. Mm -hmm.